What's up, church? How you guys doing? So uh, this one was different. They, uh, they ushered my family and I into a dark room, and as we got settled in, I was trying to make sure that uh, my daughters, Kyrea and Piper, didn't kill each other. Uh, they're all over the place. Piper was trying to climb up to, you know, some rooms that got like a, a window, but they got a window like sill, I guess is what you would call it, like a little platform where the window is. She was trying to climb up and sit on that, and she succeeded, so I was trying to make sure she didn't, you know, fall off. And uh, while that was going on, I was trying to like switch my, uh, my attention between what they were doing and the TV on, on the wall. Uh, and, and, and then in this moment where I was like trying to make sure that they were uh, being okay, uh, that's when I heard, I believe, if I recall correctly, six words that, that changed everything. <laughs> uh, there are two babies in there. <laughs> the parents, let me see a hand. Parents, if you're a parent, go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah, like half of you are like, oh, that's awesome. And the other half of you are like, ha, better you than me. <laughs> yeah, so uh, from that point on, we've been, uh, you know, reading up on what it means to have twins and uh, trying to go shopping and buying doubles of stuff, trying to go to Walmart when they got clearance stuff. We did, and it was awesome. Uh, and, and we've just been kind of in that mode of trying to figure out what it, what's life going to look like with not – not three kids, but four kids, because we got two already, and so uh, we were really efficient. We actually wanted four kids, uh, and, and my wife, when she gets pregnant, she's typically miserable for the first trimester, um, and just nauseous all the time. If that's too much information for you, then uh, you'll get there if you get married and have kids. It won't be a big deal. Um, but so we've been in this mode, and, and she's been up and down, just you know, nauseous here, okay here, but a lot of fatigue, and I think she's kind of past the nauseous point. But this past week, uh, she was telling me about her day, and she told me that Kyrea, it was like laundry day, and Kyrea asked uh, my wife Sarah if she could do laundry with her. I was like, oh, that's adorable. And she ended up like helping her all day with, you know, loading, unloading, folding, and putting away all the clothes. And, and that's kind of how Kyrea is, my oldest daughter. She's, she has a heart of a helper, of a servant. She's always, like, wanting to help me uh, cook, which can be dangerous and stuff, because I'm not very good of a cook, but, you know, it's also hot stuff, you know. And uh, she's also always wanting to help with dishes and, like, cleaning the floor and uh, just all the, all the things. She's always wanting to help. And, you know, I have a lot to learn from her. Because she has a heart of a servant. And she's even starting to teach her sister uh, how to be a helper. And Piper's starting to learn a little bit, but she's mostly just crazy all over the place. They're very different. Um, but, you know, I have a lot to learn from her, and, and I think we all do. Uh, because many of us, you know, we like, we like the idea of being a helper, being a servant, being someone who selflessly uh, helps people in, in certain ways. We love hearing about stories about that. We love hearing about other people doing it. The, the problem is we just don't like the, that idea enough to do it ourselves. Like typically we, we like hearing about someone, like that's a nice person, that's great. I love when I have those people in my life because then they help me. Uh, but a lot of times, like, whenever something happens in our life that, that could, like, uh, we could be doing something different, like, we go and do that thing rather than, you know, go help someone move or something. And so we struggle, I think, and maybe it's just me, but uh, we like the idea of serving, but we just don't like it enough to actually do it on a consistent basis through thick and thin. No matter what life is throwing at us, sometimes when life is difficult, those are the very best moments that we should be serving, and yet we're typically self-consumed with the stuff that we're dealing with that we don't do it, and we are worse for it. And so, you know, we have a lot of excuses. Um, typically, we like the idea of serving. It's a someday when kind of thing. You know, someday when I'm not so busy, I'll serve more. Someday when I get over the, fa the, the fear of putting myself out there, I'll serve more. Someday when I start understanding what the big deal is with serving, I'll serve more. Someday when the kids are out of the house and I've got some time to think, uh, I'll serve more. Someday when I get my life put together enough, to actually have my life feeling like it's, it's okay, I'll go and help people out and serve 
more. We got a lot of excuses, but the thing is, when we put our excuses up next to the church that we're going to look at today in the first century, uh, our excuses don't measure up, and neither did theirs. And so uh, we are today continuing with our series called Withness. We've been in it for a couple months, and I think what we've been learning is the, the, the idea that, that we are better when we are together and that we are the greatest witness to a watching world when we are actually selflessly being with one another as a family. And, and Jesus told the disciples before he went back up into heaven after he rose again from the dead, uh, he's a big deal, y'all should you know, learn about him. Um, he said, uh, people will know that you are my disciples, not by uh, uh, the, the clothes that you wear, the, the, the things that you go and do on the weekend or don't do on the weekend, but by this one thing, by the way that you love one another. That's the way that people in the world will know that you are with Jesus, that Jesus guy, is by the way that you love one another. And I think this is really important for our day and time because uh, the Galatian church, they were a messed up church. Like they go to another level in even comparing ourselves with them. Like they were really messed up. And that should be kind of encouraging for us, I think. So all throughout the book of Galatians, they, uh, Paul was writing to this church that was dealing with a deep-seated, really important conflict between each other. They were, as he calls it, backbiting and devouring one another with their words and with what they were doing. Basically, these people came in and started teaching something that was, was against what Paul had been teaching, this, this basically a Mediterranean entrepreneurial church leader who was going around planting churches throughout the whole Mediterranean world. He's a big deal. He's pretty cool. Uh, God used him in, in amazing ways, and he's the one who's writing this letter to them. He heard about what's going on, and he's trying to help them understand, hey, uh, there, there's the gospel that I preached to you, and, and now you are trying to follow this other thing, and this other thing is leading you to destruction, it's leading you to destruction. And so what we're going to dive into is, is basically the, the situation of a church that was becoming vicious side takers. And of course, in our day and time, we don't know anything about that, right? And so it, you have to understand, put yourself in the place of being in conflict with the people around you right now. And that's what the situation was in Galatia, okay? And so we're going to dive in. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and pull that out. If you don't, there's a, one in the seat back in front of you. Uh, I said it right this time. It's on page 1034. I really encourage you, even though the, the words are going to be on the screen, go ahead and grab that and just interact with the physical text of Scripture. Uh, to me, it's like uh, another sensory experience that kind of helps you learn it. Um, I think it's just more powerful that way. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, but... Uh, go ahead and grab that, Galatians 5, and we're going to dive into a few scriptures, a few verses, page 1034. Even made it easy for you, gave you the page number. Cool. So this is what it says, Galatians 5, verse 13. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Now, I'd be doing you a disservice if I didn't read verse 12 uh, as well. So let's read that as well, verse 12 and 13. This is what he said right before that. I wish those who are, distur who are disturbing you might also let themselves be mutilated. For you are called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. See, one of the things that sticks out um, in this letter is, you know, there's a formal way of writing letters in the first century, you know, just like we do if you ever, like, write a handwritten letter, you know, dear whatever, you know, you kind of do a little small talk, like, I'm really excited for, you know, all the things that's happened in your life, here's some things that happened in my life, and now I'm going to get to the point of my message, right? Um, but you probably understand this, like, sometimes when you're in conflict with, with someone, like, you, you, you have some kind of beef with them, you don't want to deal with small talk, right? Like, if it's a big deal, you just get right to the point. Say, hey, we need, we need to deal with this. And that's kind of how 
Paul's introduction was. It sticks out because it was really short, like hummingbird short. You know, because like the hummingbird never got picked on the basketball team because it's so short. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now you get it. And that's cool. Uh, so it was really short, and he was really upset with them because he's deeply convicted that they, here's, here's the idea that they were being told and they were following, you need to become Jewish before you can follow Jesus. You need to become circumcised and follow the law of Moses before you can, can walk and follow Jesus Christ, the one who said that he fulfilled the law. And so they were going back to this way of thinking, this way of living. And, and what Paul is doing throughout this whole letter is he is laying out eloquently and powerfully the fact that Jesus fulfilled the things that Jews were trying and striving to fulfill themselves. He's saying, no, now, now the way that we live right now is by being led by the Spirit of God because he indwells you as a follower of Jesus. And what that looks like is now the family of God. God is bringing every person from all walks of life, every background, every nationality, ethnicity, everything. And he is bringing us all together into one family because we are adopted into the family of God. You don't need to go and join someone else's family, but God is starting a new thing and he is bringing us all together into one one and he's saying that there is no longer a Jew or a Greek that barrier is gone there is no longer a slave or a free that barrier is gone there is no longer male and female under Christ they are gone the barriers are gone whatever kind of social stigmas we have with one another those things are gone demolished destroyed because we are now all one in Jesus we are clothed with him and so it is through Jesus that we are now brought together, unified, and the very fact that you guys are in deep conflict with one another about this very thing, you are missing the entire point of what Jesus came to do. He's saying you have been set free from the bondage you are in of following the law because the bondage you are in is because you couldn't do it. And Jesus had to come and live that perfect life to die that death that we could not do and to raise again, defeating sin and death, so that we could have hope as if we kept the law of Moses perfectly. And so Paul's really like, he's really convicted and kind of upset with them. He's very much concerned with helping the Galatians in understanding who they are in Christ and how they are to live on an everyday level because that was one of the other pieces that they were working through. Like they, they were wanting to understand what does this faith look like every single day? If you tell me that I have freedom and I don't need to follow all these like festivals and all these, 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 these things to go with the law of Moses, then how do I know what is good and what is bad? Like how do I know what I'm supposed to do? It, is, is this the line? Like where, where is the line? I need to know where that line is because I want to make sure that I'm living for God. But more, more so, I want to make sure that I'm in line with the rules. And so they were dealing with that. And I'm sure a lot of the leaders were like, you know, uh, this makes sense. If we could just kind of put some guardrails up and have these rules listed, uh, all like 600 of them, then maybe we would be okay as far as like living this, this, this life in this world where there's all kinds of craziness all around us. All this kind of sinfulness all around us. Like, y'all know, like... If you need to go do something, some of us, we would just like to have the step-by-step -step instructions, right? Amen. But instead, God has given us something better, and that is the Spirit of God living inside of us, compelling us, driving us, pushing us, guiding us, comforting us. That is what we do as followers of Jesus. We walk by the Spirit of God. And so he's concerned with this conflict, and that conflict is in threaded throughout. Like, he's addressing that very thing all throughout, front and center for him. I'm going to read that again, Galatians 5.13, because a lot of times, I don't know about you, but I need to hear something like a million times before I get it. Uh, for you were called to be free. Freedom, good, right? Some freedom? Cool. Uh, brothers and sisters... I find that to be interesting. He calls them brothers and sisters because they're brought together in the same family. He's trying to remind them that, hey, y'all are related in some way. 
Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But serve one another, serve one another through love. He's saying with Christ, you have freedom. Without Christ, you are in bondage. So why are you leaving Jesus and trying to adopt the law again? Jesus came so you didn't have to do that because he did it. And so you were covered in him. He's saying, don't use this freedom for doing whatever the flesh wants. Don't be holding grudges because you're in conflict. Don't be developing cliques so that you can keep the outsiders out and and you can stay with your own kind. Don't do that. Y'all need to work through this conflict. This conflict is an opportunity for you guys to understand what actually keeping the law looks like. So use that freedom to serve one another through love. Our freedom in Christ ought to be used for us to live Christ-like. And so, like, we're thinking, right, all right, cool, we got it, Brandon. We, you know, serve one another. Cool. Sounds good. But uh, usually when I'm preparing a sermon, I'll, I'll you know, look at the Greek because uh, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. And uh, who, who in here, like, speaks more than one language? Raise a hand, raise a high, or, or you read it, or you can write it. Cool. Some of you. Okay, cool. So, so y'all know what I'm about to say is true, but for everyone else who only speaks English, um, what you need to understand is that when we translate a word from another language to English, a lot of times we, u- we lose the thrust of whatever we're translating. Because Koine Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, it, it has the ability to pack inside one word much more complexity and much more meaning than an English word does. Okay? And I found something to be really interesting. The word when he says, uh, do, you know, you've been set free, so use this freedom, that word freedom, uh, it's actually the Greek word, I know, I know y'all won't remember this, but I'm going to tell you it so, so y'all know, uh, eleutherion. Okay? That's, that's the, the, the Greek word that he uses for freedom. And the interesting piece of that is it carries with the idea that you are set free, not from a totalitarian government, not from, uh, you know, big brother watching us and taking away our rights here and there, but from slavery, from being in deep bondage where you are subject to someone or something else. Okay? So free. And we get that. So they're using that freedom from bondage as an opportunity, not for the flesh, but... As an opportunity to serve one another. Now that the word serve, this is where it gets really cool um, and to me really beautiful and, and, and kind of mind-boggling. Uh, because what, I think when he said this, they would have paused and pondered this for a while. The, the, the Greek word for serve is douluete. That's the case and all that stuff. I won't get into that. Um, and it carries with it the idea that we would serve as one who is a subject to someone else. As a slave. Y'all see that? You have been set free from bondage to sin and death, and you are to use that freedom as an excuse to now subject yourselves under your brothers and sisters in Christ and serve them. So that's what it looks like to follow Jesus. We are set free from the things that... that, uh, held us back from living in God's grace and living in God's purposes. And now through Jesus, we have been set free so that we would be willing. This is what the Spirit of God does. When we walk by the Spirit of God, you'll know that you are being obedient when you are willingly subjecting yourself to another person. And get this, remember the context. They were in deep conflict with one another. And so I think the very next time you are in a conflict with someone... Maybe one of the most Christ-like things that you can do is lay down that conflict, lay down that bitterness, lay down that grudge, (laughs) and go clean their car. Or go clean their house. I mean, the most Christ-like thing would be to clean their feet, but that would be weird. (laughs) Might get kicked. And so he's saying that in Christ we've been set free from being slaves, and so we are supposed to use that freedom to subject ourselves to another, serving one another 
Because we are driven by the love of Christ that isn't simply vertical between me and God. It is horizontal between me and you. And so this is one of the things that, that we miss in our Western world when we talk about, I got a personal relationship with Jesus. That's great. Have a relationship with Christ. That's important. But you need to have an understanding that when we have a relationship with Jesus, that changes our relationships with people. That we have a love that is driven vertically and horizontally. We are, we are rescued and ransomed and reconciled to God, and we ought to be reconciled to each other as well. And so that's what he's working through with them. Y'all are in conflict about this theological thing that shouldn't even be on your radar. Y'all know better. And you are, are let, me, let me just get to this. He continues. Verse 14 and 15. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. I find it funny that he uses their concern to keep the law as an excuse to show them how in Christ we are to walk by the Spirit of God, and in doing so, in, in obeying that, we fulfill the law. Because the Spirit of God will always compel us, always drive us, always push us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Whenever we look out for our own interests, we are not saying yes to Jesus, we are saying yes to ourselves. And so that is what the ethic, the driving ethic of following Jesus looks like. And he's saying, if you're curious what that doesn't look like, then y'all need to look in the mirror or, or start recording your next Bible study because y'all are acting ridiculous. Y'all are biting and devouring one another. Like, this is just not okay. Because if you continue going down this path, you will eventually get to where you are going. And that is a place of relational carnage. And that's not a place for followers of Jesus to be. And so he's, he's like really upset. Because they were called to, set, to be set free and to live in that. And I think he's saying the quicker we see Jesus being the sole source of life, the quicker we will be able to sense what the Spirit of God is leading us to do. He's saying use this conflict you're in. Conflict can be a good thing. It can be a really good tool. Use this conflict as an opportunity to subject yourselves to each other and take on the role of servant with the heart of a servant, the heart of Jesus. Y'all know that you can be in a position of being a servant and not have the heart of a servant? Um, I was a waiter at Bandito's, it's a Mexican restaurant in Fort Wayne for a while, and I was like 19 and, and, and just really deeply broken, very much concerned about my own stuff. And I was a server, but I didn't have the heart of a servant. But you know when you, when you meet someone who's doing their job with the heart of a servant, that sticks out, right? Because that's what we're called to have. But oftentimes the world doesn't do that. But think about how common this is. Let me just play this out. Uh, you see at work two people, they're in a constant conflict all day long. I don't know what it is. You, you fill in the gaps. And they go home still in conflict, and then you see later on Facebook at like 10 p.m. a picture of both of them. Like they took a selfie, a happy selfie. Uh, neither one of them having black eyes, you know, it's, it's all good. Um, and what, what ended up happening was they told the story on, on the caption, and they said, you know, we were in conflict, you know, we did all this stuff, uh, and we were really frustrated with one another. But one of them decided, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to that person's house, uh, bucket and chemicals in hand. And I'm going to wash that person's car. And before the end of the day, both person's car was cleaned. And they were both reconciled to each other. Not because they worked through whatever the thing was. Maybe they did. But the, the barriers were brought down because they decided they would serve one another through love. That, that never happens, right? You ever seen that happen? But, but I think that's the idea. Imagine if the church dealt with conflict like that. Like, like y'all have a conflict with a friend who's in the church, like coming to the church office and trying to get counsel 
from, from one of us. If, if you come to my office, I'm going to just say, hey, y'all need to clean each other's house. Because that's what we're called to do. That's how we work through stuff. We can have disagreements, that's fine, but when it gets to, to be bitterness and grudges, then we need to subject ourselves to one another. And even in the midst of that conflict, before it even gets to that point, we need to be willing to subject ourselves to them and serve them because we love with the love that Christ has. And so I believe that that's what it looks like when we use our freedom to choose love. And I believe what the Galatians were missing was the point that God's deep desire for them is for them to be a family that flourishes. That's a good word, right? Flourish. That just sounds good. That they were supposed to flourish in, through, and beyond conflict and whatever other circumstances that they come into contact with. And the key to live uh, in a way that we are flourishing as a family is to live in service to each other because that's the way of love. That's the way of flourishing. And science agrees. Science agrees. Uh, I'm going to butcher their names, but... uh, two PhD peeps, uh, Tristan Inagaki and Naomi Eisenberger, uh, they conducted a series of fMRI uh, imaging tests, and basically what that stands for is functional magnetic resonance imaging tests, uh, to explore the neural, uh, just go with me here, it's brain science, okay? Uh, The neural mechanisms of how specific brain areas were affected by giving social support versus receiving social support. So by the idea, they're comparing what is it like, what happens in our brains when we serve someone, and then let's compare that to what happens in our brains when we are served ourselves, when someone serves us, okay? And so what they found was that giving social support or serving ultimately had greater brain benefits than receiving social support. So when we serve someone, something powerful happens in our brain. I find this to be really interesting. You may not, and that's fine, uh, but this is what's happening in your brain when you serve someone. When we serve, our brain experiences a reduction in stress-related activity in the, I'm going to tell you the areas, it doesn't really matter, uh, but y'all just need to know, uh, hold on, in the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, that's one area, the right anterior insula, and the right amygdala, okay? Uh, so what, what that means is when we, when we willingly serve someone, When we actually do what Jesus tells us to do, it lowers our stress. We are less stressed when we are serving. And y'all probably know, like, when you serve, like, it's tiresome. Like, it can be tiresome, but you're less stressed. More, uh, when we serve, our brain experiences an increase in its reward circuitry. This is really interesting. Uh, Because what that does is the reward circuitry, it increases motivation, associative learning, and positive emotions like joy. And happiness. And that happens in the left and right ventral striatum. I don't know if I said that right. But if you want to be a happier, more joyful person who's more motivated to do good, then serve someone. Another thing, when we serve, our brain experiences an increase in caregiving related activity in the septal area. We all have people in our lives who are very caring, and we, we like look at them and we're like, I wish I was like that. Well, the way you get like that is to serve someone, is to willingly subject yourself to another so that you are willing to serve them. And so isn't that amazing? Like, I find that to be really cool because it, it, it's, it's, we shouldn't be surprised because no mistake that the one who wired our brains to operate in the way that they do is calling us to do something that helps our brains and our bodies and our minds flourish. It's no mistake that when we follow Jesus and what he's calling us to do, we actually benefit from it. But we don't do it because we benefit. We do it because we are being obedient and because we love him and we love people. And so it's kind of like you could could serve people selfishly, that's fine, just for those benefits. Like, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, just start serving someone. You'll feel better. Following Jesus, like, not only does he save you, 
uh, for eternity and changes your life here. But you can follow some of his stuff and you would be like, well, I feel better about myself. It's cool. But we'll get, we'll get back to that later. So imagine this. What we are willing to do for family, we should be willing to do for each other. Look around. Each other. The church. The congregation. A body of believers. Whatever words you want to say. Whatever we are willing to do for family, we should be willing to do for each other. Because we are willing to sacrifice for our family, aren't we? Why? Because we believe in the importance of family. And, and for those of you who are here and you've, you've been a part of a broken family, things aren't all hunky-dory when we talk about family for you. I want you to know that when you find your place in Christ and you start becoming a part of the church, you discover that the family you were meant to be a part of is right here. It's right here. I don't know what kind of conflicts y'all have in your families. I don't know what kind of pain you've experienced. But I do know that I've experienced pain because of family strife. You know, sometimes when our families aren't even willing to fight for us, we need to be willing to run to the arms of our brothers and sisters in Christ because we have a bond that is deeper than blood. It's a bond that is united by his blood, supernatural divine blood. So I don't know what you've experienced, but we usually, in an ideal world, sacrifice for our family, we serve for our family, we go to bat for our family. And even if that's not your story, I want you to know that you can find that here. Not in just some like, oh, they, felt, they made me feel welcome, and I smiled, and they smiled, it was a great time. But you can do life with the people in this room. You can find a place to belong far before you ever even believe. I want you to know that God wants us to flourish as a family. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this, it is not the experience of Christian brotherhood, but solid and certain faith in brotherhood that holds us together. In other words, we are held together by our faith in the fact that we need each other. Through thick and thin, whether we like each other or not, we need each other. Because when we are serving one another and loving one another, it won't always be easy. We'll have conflict because we're people. But nothing that happens to us should have the power to separate us from each other. So I have to ask you one simple question. If you're here today and you're a follower of Christ, you've given your life to him, and you're not serving, why? Why? Like, are you too busy? Are you afraid of putting yourself out there? Are you afraid of commitment? Or do you just Simply not give a rip. Because what God calls us to do is to have a love that moves. Because we walk by the Spirit of God who indwells us as followers of Christ, who pushes us to serve each other. Because if the Spirit of God actually compelled and guided Paul to say what he said in verse 13 that we have been set free and we're supposed to use that freedom as an opportunity for us to not use our, to indulge in our flesh, but to serve one another through love, then what's holding you back? The Galatian church, even though that their excuses didn't measure up, they still had some excuses that are probably better than yours. God's call to them in the midst of conflict was to serve one another. And I think what God is telling us here today is that we need to be willing and actually do simplifying our lives so that we can serve. If, you're not, if your life is not simplified enough to where you can serve someone, then you've got some simplifying to do. You've got some changes to make. 
Because if serving each other is the one, one of the ways we follow Jesus, then we need to lay down our other commitments and dive in and serve. Because Jesus laid down his life and he calls us to do the same. He left the throne in heaven to come down, be with us, to live with us, to die for us, and to rise again so that we could defeat the enemy, so that we could have real life. So that we would not only that, but be sealed by his spirit and be guided in a relationship that is deeper than anything we could even understand every single day. Because we're called to be together and to serve each other. Because togetherness always involves service. If we want to actually live the life that God is calling us to live, we want to be the people of God, then we need to prioritize service to each other. Togetherness is worth it, and I pray that God changes your heart, that if it's not there, if you're not there where you understand that togetherness is worth it, I pray that he will change it. Now, some of you are like, yes, that's, that's great. Like, I see it. It's clear. Like, sign me up now. But you're like, uh, I don't really, I don't know that I have anything to offer. Some of you may be there. So I just wanted to address that with a little bit of a story. Um, on, on May 25th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy uh, told Congress of his goal to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. And Nancy Duarte, she's an author, in her book, Resonate, tells the story this way. This is what she said. Kennedy said in the speech, in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. It will be an entire nation, for all of us must work to put him there. He wanted the entire country to feel responsible for supporting his vision. And later in the 1960s, JFK was touring NASA headquarters and stopped to talk to a man with a mop. The president asked him, what do you do? What do you do? The janitor replied, I'm putting the first man on the moon, sir. The janitor could have said, I clean floors and empty trash. Instead, he saw his role as part of the bigger mission that was to fulfill the vision of the president. As far as he was concerned, he was making history. And so, no matter the role, big or small, whatever you think it is, it's all connected because we are a group that is interdependent on each other. We are all dependent on God and each other to live the life we're called to live. If you are here and you're a follower of Christ and you're a part of this church and you are not serving, we are missing out. You are missing out. The people who are coming here, visiting, and who do not know Christ yet are missing out because you are not using your gifts to serve him. And so I have one thing for us to do. One thing. If you're here today and you serve on a ministry team at The Crossing, God bless you and thank you for being willing to subject yourselves to the rest of the body so that we could all benefit from your willingness to serve Christ and to serve us. But if you're here today and you're not a part of a ministry team and you follow Jesus, then I want to encourage you to start a conversation with us. That's it. It's not obligated. But to go ahead and put that thing on the screen real quick. There we go. All you got to do, start a conversation. Text your name and email to that number, and that's all we're going to do. I don't want to just throw you in a spot just because that's a spot. I want you to help, help you understand how God has wired you so that you can serve him with your unique gifts, your unique uh, passions and skills. Okay? So text your name and your email to that number, you can do it right now or later, whatever. Write it down if you're not willing to do it right now. And, and start the conversation. Begin serving. Or uh, if you don't want to do that, you can go into next steps right over here in the lobby. And you can, you can start it that way as well. Um, that's it. When, when I first became a, a Christ follower, uh, my wife and I, we served together at the front door. And we just opened doors for people and smiled at people and Welcome them to the church. And that was huge. It was a blessing. It was a blast. It, it, it caused us to understand what serving looks like. It doesn't matter what role you think is significant and insignificant. They're all significant because we are all on a mission to help people understand that God loves them. That he came to this world to rescue them. And every piece 
matters. You matter. So, togetherness always involves service, friends, so let's serve. Would you guys stand with me? We're, we're going to pray. And I think we've got one more song to sing and worship to God. Father, thank you for bringing us all to this place for this time so that we can learn what it looks like to be a family, to be together, to be Christ to each other. God, please guide us, please propel us, and please push us to be willing to serve one another, to use our freedom, to willingly subject ourselves to each other so that we can be a family that flourishes. God, you are good, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.